Hello and welcome to week three, supplement one of EGM 703, complex numbers. In this lesson, we'll discuss the mathematical concept of complex numbers and explain how these can be used in remote sensing and specifically in radar remote sensing. Before we dive right in, we're going to start with polynomials. As you will hopefully recall, any polynomial with degree n should have n roots. In other words, if f of x is a polynomial with degree n, then there are n numbers, not necessarily unique, where f is going to be equal to 0. For example, if f of x is equal to x squared minus 1, f has two roots at plus 1 and minus 1. And we can check this by setting f of x equal to 0 and solving for x. Hopefully, it's clear that x equals plus and minus 1 is the solution here. All right, so far so good, right? So what happens if we have f of x is equal to x squared plus 1? Well, let's try to solve this like we did before. First, we set f equal to 0, but now we have x squared equals minus 1. We know that ordinarily, we can't take the square root of a negative number, but we also know that f has to have two roots. f is a polynomial, and we can't just selectively decide that polynomials are only polynomials in certain cases. So we have to move beyond the conventional math that we might be used to, and we do this by defining the square root of minus 1 to be a number i, and the roots of f are then given as plus or minus i. We say that the roots, z, of this polynomial are complex. You may also see it written this way, and this notation just means that z is part of, or in, the set of complex numbers denoted by this fancy c. We can also write a complex number z as follows. z is equal to a plus i times b, where a and b are real numbers, in other words, the regular old floating point numbers that were so familiar with, and we say that a corresponds to the real, in quotation marks, part of z, and b is the imaginary part. Don't get too caught up on the names here. Despite the name, the imaginary part of z is every bit as important and real as the real part of z. We can also think about z as being a vector that has components a and b. The horizontal axis here is known as the real axis because the value on this axis corresponds to the real part of z, while the vertical axis is also known as the imaginary axis because the value on this axis corresponds to the imaginary part of z. So this vector then has a length, also known as the modulus or magnitude, and it's denoted as the absolute value of z. This is equal to the square root of the sum of the squares of the real and imaginary parts. The vector z makes an angle with the real axis, also known as the argument of z, and denoted here by the Greek letter phi. We can calculate phi as the arctangent, or inverse tangent, of the imaginary part of z divided by the real part of z. And from this representation, we can also see that the real part of z is equal to the magnitude of z multiplied by the cosine of the angle z, while the imaginary part is equal to the magnitude multiplied by the sine of the angle of z. We can also define the complex conjugate of z, denoted z star, and this is just the reflection of z across the real axis. In other words, we multiply b by negative 1. In addition to thinking of z as a vector, we can also write z in other ways. We've seen the complex notation already, where z is equal to a plus i times b, but we can also write this in polar notation. Here, we're just replacing a with the magnitude multiplied by the cosine of the angle, and replacing b with the magnitude, of, with the magnitude multiplied by the sine of the angle, and then we rearrange so that we factor out the magnitude. So it turns out that this value here, cosine of phi plus i times sine of phi, is equal to Euler's number, e, raised to the power of i times phi. 
And using that identity, we can also write z using Euler notation, where z is equal to the magnitude of z multiplied by e to the i times phi. Okay, so what if we want to add two complex numbers together? Well, because we can represent complex numbers as vectors, this is just vector addition. So let's say we have one number, z1, and another number, z2. So then z1 plus z2 is just the sum of these two vectors. And if we write this out using the components, we can group the real, uh, the real parts together like this and the imaginary parts together like this. And so the new real part is just the sum of the two individual real parts, and the new imaginary part is just the sum of the two, the two original imaginary parts. The magnitude of this vector is then equal to the square root of the sum of the squares of the real and the imaginary parts, and the angle, or the argument, is just the arctangent of the imaginary part divided by the real part. Okay, so addition doesn't look so bad. Multiplication, though, gets very complicated very quickly if we continue using this notation. So just as an example, if we multiply z1 by z2, then we have to multiply each of these different parts out. So we end up with a1 times a2 plus a1 times i times b2 times or plus i times b1 times a2 plus i squared times b1 times b. Huh. Now remember that i squared is just minus 1. So then we can reorganize this and write it out as follows. The real part of z1 times z2 is the, the real, yeah, the real part of z1 times z2 is just a1 times a2 minus b1 times b2 plus i times a1 times b2 plus a2 times b1. On the other hand, if we were to write this using Euler notation, we would have the following. This is just the magnitude of z1 times the magnitude of z2 times e to the times e to i times the sum of the angles of z1 and z2. So now we're going to see why it is that we're learning about complex numbers in a remote sensing class. So let's think about a signal that is oscillating as a function of time and we're going to call this u of t. If we look at this as a vector with some magnitude and an angle which varies in time, we can see that this is going to trace out a circle around the origin. At one point in time, the vector will point in this direction. At another point in time, it'll point over here and over here and over here and so on. So this is just the same as the complex numbers that we've been looking at. The real component of this signal is given by the magnitude of z multiplied by the cosine of the angle, while the imaginary component of this signal is given by the magnitude of z multiplied by the sine of the angle. So we can actually represent this oscillating signal, u of t, the same way that we've represented our complex numbers. It turns out we're already pretty familiar with oscillating signals, as we've covered in a few different lessons at this point. Electromagnetic radiation is a wave that oscillates in time. And as we'll see in the rest of the lessons this week, radar signals, are a which are a specific kind of electromagnetic radiation, can also be represented in this way. So in this lesson, we've discussed how complex numbers aren't that scary. They're just another way of doing arithmetic. They simplify a lot of, some of, a lot of really complicated math, and we can use them to represent oscillating signals like waves. In addition, in next week's lecture, we'll see some other ways that we can use complex numbers in remote sensing applications. That's all for this lesson. I hope you found it interesting, and if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to email me or post in the discussion forum on Blackboard. Bye.